Beautiful. Hello, hello. It's being complicated, but we we live. So I've been asked by Alessandro to make this in English because they wanted to stream it. If at any point in time I'm going too fast, just make a sign like a frowning face and I'll go slower. So I have that effect. Uh, tonight we'll be talking about error handling in Rust. Uh, some of you may fami be familiar with Rust, some of you may be familiar with Rust in general, and some of you may be familiar with exception and different modes of doing error handling. So hopefully the talk is useful to each one of you, regardless of your familiarity with the language. For those of you who haven't had the pleasure to meet yet, my name is Luca, I work at TrueLayer, so I'm one of Alessandro's colleagues, I'm a principal engineer, and I co-organize the Rust Random Meetup. Um, so that's what I do for the Rust community up there. I am known for having done a bunch of open source software, some better than others, um, and I've also written a book for Rust, which is probably what I'm best known for. Now, a lot of people, when they talk about Rust, they complain that error handling is hard. In reality, what I actually think is that error handling in general is hard. And then when you, com you combine that problem with the specificity of the Rust language, then you get a little bit of a challenge. You're like, how do I actually encode my error handling patterns in Rust? Now, through this talk, we'll go into three sections. We'll look at what an error is in general, regardless of the programming language. Now, we'll try to build a model for error handling in Rust from scratch, assuming nothing about what we know and how error handling is done today in Rust. And then we'll look at some do's and don'ts when it comes to actual applications within in Rust. Now, another we have an error. What is an error when it gets into the philosophical? Now, we say that we have an error every time some operation that we are trying to accomplish does not yield the result we expect. Now, throughout the, uh, the section of the, of the talk, we'll be talking about HTTP calls as a driving example, just to give some, some concrete reference that we can all think about. And when you're doing an HTTP call, you have a client and a server. In this case, the server is a blog platform, so you can post articles and you expect them to show up somewhere. Now, if the client is sending a post article request to the server, the happy ending scenario is the server coming back with a 200. So you can expect that this article appears somewhere and everybody's happy. In reality, this is not necessarily what happens. So you could get, for example, a 429 back from the server. The 429 means that the server is overloaded and therefore the client couldn't succeed in actually making the operation they wanted to make. Now, the HTTP protocol is what is being used between the client and the server. And the client does understand the HTTP protocol. Therefore, it does understand that status codes have an agreed upon meeting. And it knows that a 429 means that you probably need to wait, potentially retry after a while, and you may succeed. The programmer who actually built the client knows this, and if he did his homework, actually programmed the client beforehand to actually match this failure mode. What this means is that the client is aware and is gonna react accordingly. The entire reaction to the failure mode is automated. So what we'd expect to see, we expect the client to wait, retry, perhaps a couple of times, perhaps we back off if they're being gentle, and eventually they may succeed. Now, different types of failure modes cannot be handled in the same way. So let's look at something different. You may have the server coming back to the client with a 400 bad request error. What that means, is that the input that was submitted by the client does not satisfy some kind of validation that the server is trying to enforce. In this case, the server is trying to say, if you want to publish an article, that has to have a title. The title cannot be empty. In this case, once again, the client understands what the 400 status code means, but there's actually no viable recovery strategy that you can perform in an automated fashion. Well, you may have the client generate a random block title, but that's probably not what you expect. So the reality is that you need to perform some kind of escalation. So you need to escalate from the realm of the computer to the realm of the humans, which in practice means the client must show up this error message to a user. This might be in the terminal, this might be in a browser, this might be in a mobile app, and then the user can react to the error. So the client is just responsible of translating the error from the context of the contract to the context of the user. Let's look at one more last failure mode. So the server can also return with a 500 internal server error. Once again, we can expect the client uh, to perform some retries, but let's assume that the retries do not succeed. 
What this means is that the client, once again, is going to escalate this to the user, and it's going to say, hello, hello, uh, you couldn't succeed in publishing a blog post. The reality about 500, though, is that you actually don't know what happened, because something went wrong in the implementation of the server. And the user is not going to be given any details, perhaps for security purposes, but most importantly, because the internal implementation details of the server are not of a concern to the user. And there's nothing that the user could do, even if this matter such was like a database is filled up. It's not the user who can fix these kind of problems. So what you want is you want to escalate to a different human, which in this case I'm going to call the operator. So the operator knows the internal implementation details of the systems. And it also has the right level of permission to do something about the failure. And so the operator is going to go in, perhaps it's going to look at some diagnostic, this might be some logs, this might be some metrics, this might be some traces, and potentially it's going to do something. Like in this case, this might be a problem with SQL connections, and they might kill some connections, kill some pods, do some stuff. So to recap, what do we have? We have one API error, so various failure modes that the same API can spit out. And for the same API error, we have three different audiences. You have the users who are using the software to do something. You have the operator, which are responsible for the, well fun for the functionality of the software. And then you have the machines. The machines need a stable contract in order to perform automated control flow, which can either lead to uh, automated error resolution or can lead to some kind of user-facing report. Users instead do not need stable contracts, human can read natural language, but they need error messages which are tuned to their level of context. If we fail to do so, we are not providing a good user experience. You don't want to be on a machine and see a blue screen of that with like stack traces. That's not what you want your software to do. Last but not least, operators have exactly the opposite needs. They want to see as much information as possible with some caveats. Because they understand the inner workings of the system, and any piece of information is a breadcrumb that they can actually use and leverage when they're trying to troubleshoot. And so the question becomes, how can we actually satisfy these three different needs when we're building software? Because we need to do error handling and be able to satisfy the user, the operator, and the machines. And we're trying to see what that looks like in Rust. How should we model error? Now, up until now, we talked about HTTP calls, now we're going to talk about function calls. So you have some part of your program that is trying to do something, and it's going to leverage some other part of a library of your program, whatever that is, that may fail in execute whatever they're doing. And we're going to start from first principles. So assume nothing. I'm going to assume that you know what the Rust language is, perhaps a bunch of syntax, but I don't expect you to know anything about that rendering in Rust. So, What's the most basic type of error handling that you can implement? The most basic type that comes to my mind is you can detect if something went wrong and nothing else. So one way of doing that in Rust is by using an enum. So let's assume once again that we have a create article, in this, in this case is a function. Create article is going to return a fallible enum. Fallible is an enum, as we described. It can have values attached to its variants because Rust supports algebraic types, which given that this is a functional meetup, I expect it's familiar to everybody here. Uh, in the epic case, we're going to return the success type, which means whatever the function is expected to do in the epic scenario. If you're creating an article, this means returning the article ID. So I created an entry to the system. Now it's an entity. It's been persisted. It has an identifier. If something goes wrong, we're going to return the error variant. The error variant is exactly what you see there. Something went wrong. I don't know what, I don't know why, I don't necessarily care. And so when we're invoking this function, Rust will force us to handle the error. So we'll force us to match on the fallible instance, and we can print something along the lines of, we found an issue, and we couldn't actually publish the article. Which sucks, but is a way to start out. Now, obviously, you don't have a lot of details into what went wrong, so this is not what you want to land. So, step number two, we want to improve error reporting capabilities, which at the very bare minimum means having some kind of error message. So, we do the most obvious modification to the fallible enum. We're going to add a string in there on the error variant, and if something goes wrong, we're going to print it, log it, return it to the user, whatever we want to do. And this is already much better, so we're going to get some context. But the reality is that this doesn't fit the model we discussed before. So users want this error message to be high level, something along the lines of, 
there was an error with the server, therefore we can publish your article. The operator wants that error message to be, I have a saturated connection pool, therefore I cannot do this query into the database. If we try to satisfy the user, then the operator won't be able to troubleshoot. If we try to satisfy the operator, then the user is gonna get a gibberish error message. And if we try to do it in the middle, everybody's gonna be upset. So obviously this doesn't work. What we can try to do is we can try to literally have two different error messages. So second variant, we do the most basic thing once again. And so we add two fields to the error variant. You have user report and you have operator report. They're both strings. One we're gonna return to the user. That might be, let's say, in the response of HTTP server. The other one we're actually gonna log, which is what rely on when they try to troubleshoot. Uh, but what happens? We still haven't told about machines. So we want to be able to perform for certain kinds of failure some kind of automated recovery. And our error struct at the moment only has reports, which are pretty much natural text. So the only way we have to, for example, detect that 429 that we were talking about before is try to match on the string. And string matching is very brittle because those are error messages uh, told about for humans. And humans can understand this error message even if it changes. So if, for example, we reward the error to make it clearer, we may break something like this. So in reality, we don't really want to be doing string matching when we need to do control flow, because this may lead to some surprises in production. What we want to do is we want to have a stable contract. In the same way, the status codes, as we talked about before in the server example, are a stable way that machines can pattern match on. We want something similar for our function calls. And what that look like, looks like is an additional variant on this enum. So we're gonna get an error type, so a second generic, and we're gonna add it inside our error variant. Therefore, when we actually go and try to do control flow, we can check if we're dealing with a specific variant of the error. And this is actually, now, most applications, uh, but you wanna try to do something better. Here, there's a lot of duplication. So you have a user report, you have an operator report, you have an error type. All these things contain similar information that needs to be rendered differently depending on the context. What we wanna do is we want to remove this duplication. So we're got just gonna have the error type. The error type is gonna have enough information to generate both the operator report and the user report on the fly. Now in Rust there are two traits that you find in the standard library. Trait is an interface, so something that you implement and has a bunch of methods. One is called debug, and as the name implies, you are supposed to return as much information as possible in the debug implementation of your type. And almost all types should implement the bug out of the box. The second one is called display, and as the name implies, once again, it's for display to users. So it's a representation that usually is meant to be user visible. And this is exactly what we wanted. So we can use display to generate the user report, and we can use the bug to generate the operator report. And this is the advantage of being lazy. So we're not actually generating the user report or the operator report unless we actually need them, which may or may not be the case. If you have a 4 to 9, for example, you may retry, that retry may succeed, at which point you never need the user report because you never need to report any error to the user because you handled it automatically. So this is quite nice. Now, reality obviously is usually a bit more complex than what we've seen so far. And so an application is not a single function call that does everything. It's a function call into a function that perhaps calls another function then perhaps calls another function. We can imagine quite easily that our create article implementation does not do on its own a full HTTP client implementation, including the protocol on the transport layer. It's probably calling some HTTP client function underneath who's actually gonna deal with the HTTP layer. And that function is fallible on its own and will have its own error type. So how do we actually make it so that we capture all the required details? That's because let's assume our create article error looks like this. So we have three variants, we have rate limited, we have invalid inputs, and we have everything else. So something went wrong, we don't care about the details. In reality, this is generated from an underlying HTTP error, which is returned by that send HTTP request function. And we do map a bunch of status errors into rate limited and invalid inputs, and everything else goes into generic error. And you can see a problem here, that generic error doesn't have any data attached. So it's just a variant with no data. What that means is that we are actually losing context. When you actually go and try to generate an operator report, you can only do it so from the data stored in create article error, and there's actually no data there, which is not good. 
So what we can do is we can try to store the source. So when you're wrapping an error at a certain level of the stack and you're returning it at a higher level in the stack, you always keep track of the underlying error. And so when I am actually publishing the operator report, I can also include the details of the source. Obviously, um, do, yes. When we're doing this, we're doing something subtle, as in we added a field to our type, which is part without having to actually break your API, mentally don't care. What you can do, you can use type erasure. So what you can say, instead of saying, I have a source, which is an HTTP error, I can say, I have a source, this in, ra in Rust is done, which basically means here, that implements both debug and display. And then you need to box it uh, for reasons that are technical and we're not gonna cover. In reality, this is not possible in Rust. You cannot actually do a DIN trait of two traits. So what you do, you do something like this. You say, if I have an error trait, anybody who can be printed in the bug and printed in display implements the error trait. And then a source is any type that implements error trait. So this protects the API and abstracts away the implementation details. In reality, this is not good enough because probably that HTTP function, once again, is not implementing the entire HTTP protocol. It's gonna rely on some stuff that, I don't know, opens sockets or does other low-level operations that we don't know about. So you have a function that calls a function that calls a function that calls a function. You need to have some level of recursivity. What this means is that I need to be able to answer the question, what is the source of the source? Because the source might have a source in, on its own. So what we can do, if we can change the error trade implementation, error trade definition. Instead of requiring just a debug and a display implementation, we can also require the error to provide us a source. The source is optional because eventually you're gonna come to something which doesn't have a further source, in which case we're gonna return none. And nine, no, that was a long, long list. So the last step is how different is the stuff we did to the stuff you find in Rust on the library. So on the left, you have our error trait. On the right, you have the standard library one. And obviously, like, when you do stuff from first principle, it's not like you can forget entirely about where you're gonna land. So this has some level of similarity. This Rust standard library started with a method called description. Description used to be the user report. So the way you display something to the user, which was later replaced by this display constraint. If you actually look at the cause method, the cause method has exactly the same signature of our source method. And that as well has been deprecated. And the reason is technical, if you want. You need the source to be static in order to be able to perform downcasting. So go back from the type erased, so that box, the in error, to a specific type, which is a pattern that sometimes is required depending on what you're doing. And that is fine. Like obviously, we've been spitballing for 20 minutes and you don't get a production-ready implementation that way but we're reasonably close. Like if you squint a little, that, that looks okay. Let's look instead at the fallible equivalent, which is obviously called result. Um, and it's very, very similar. The only difference is that our error type is constrained to implement the error trait, which is not what you find in Rust on the library. And once again, this is a technicality. The reason for this is that there are types which are often used as errors in Rust that cannot implement the error trait. And that is because of conflicted, uh, conflicting implementations. So there are some broad implementation for generic types that would conflict if you try to implement the error trait for them. So box in error, for example, what we've been using so far, cannot implement the error trait. Anyhow error, which we're gonna see in a second, does not implement the error trait. Generally speaking, opaque error types do not implement the error trait. And so the Rust and the library allows for this pattern by not requiring the bound on the actual enum but it does require the bound on the specific methods that are accessing that trait methods. So once again, not too far away from the mark, just some little technicalities that you get into when you try to do this, which is good. Now, let's look at some patterns and anti-patterns. Patterns and anti-patterns. As we said so far, when you want to provide a stable contract, usually the best option is to have an enum because enums can be pattern matched on. In particular, enums can be pattern matched exhaustively. So if you add a new enum, that means that the client code will not compile anymore. And so if you're adding a new failure mode, which is important, that's usually a very good way of signaling to your users, hello, hello, there's also this way, the stuff could go wrong. Please decide how you want to handle this kind of case. 
At the same time, you always want to be including a source if you're wrapping an error. Always, always, always include a source. If you don't, somebody somewhere is gonna have an incident and they're not gonna know why. And you don't want that to happen to you, so don't make it happen to others. Uh, for the same reason, if you can, always implement the error trait so that you can actually provide a source. And it's also intent revealing. If you implement the error trait, that signals to your users that that is meant to be an error type, which is once again nice. Obviously, that's a lot of boilerplate code that you're gonna be writing again and again and again and again. And as everybody might have guessed, some people have wrote a macro for this, which is called this error. This error, it does nothing more than generate the code you see on the right, but it's slightly more succinct. So you just annotate each variant with the display representation, you can interpolate, you can annotate stuff with the source annotation so that it automatically generates the source implementation and it does exactly what you would write by hand. Obviously, this comes at the price of having a proc macro, which means that might increase your compile times, so as always, use judiciously. Apart from those, there's a lot of don'ts. Um, so when people are given algebraic types for the first time, they tend to overdo it. So they tend to have a different enum, a different enum variant for every possible failure mode. In reality, this can be an hindrance more than an asset. If you have a bunch of minimum variants, which are almost always handled in bulk, in client code, so people always tend to group them together in a certain arm of their matches, that usually means that you are operating at different levels of abstractions. And so it may be a good shout to group those together in a single variant. For example, in this case, probably we don't really care about 500s, 502s, and 503s. We just care about the fact that the server is down. So you can have a generic error variant, and that's more than enough for your client code. This is obviously not an evaluation that is easily done in every case. Like if you're running an open source library and you have a wide range of clients, it can be somewhat difficult to understand what they need and what they don't need. But in reality, if you're writing code that is supporting your application, it's usually very easy to examine all the calling paths and say, okay, well, actually, we don't need to distinguish this kind of stuff. Another code smell, which I see a lot in libraries, is people writing one gigantic error type. So you have a gigantic error in them, and then use it across multiple functions. And some functions use all the variants, some other function only can use a subset of those. And you usually spot this when you see in client code, match an error, and there's a bunch of variants that go into a reachable. As in like, this can actually never happen. When you're doing this, you're creating a bunch of problems. Uh, first and foremost, the client code is no longer protected by the contract because they're actually making assumption on what the implementation of the method is. And some assumption can be reasonable, right? You're probably not gonna have a configuration error when you create a PR. You might have a configuration error when you create the GitHub client. And then it's reasonable to assume that cannot happen in create PR. But the error type is the same, therefore you need to write something to handle that variant of the error in them, and so you write something like this. If the library code changes tomorrow and starts retarding that config error, this is not gonna cause a compile error and therefore you're gonna have a panic in production. So usually take the time to write a different error type for each of your methods if they have different failure modes. Only reuse error types if you're really, really sure that the failure modes are identical and they're gonna stay identical in the future, which may or may not be the case. Beautiful. Uh, as we saw during the error, in, um, error modeling exercise, always erase the type of your errors, or your error sources. Most people don't care about the specific underlying um, error types that you're wrapping as a source, and so don't expose that in the API. It's almost always a mistake. It's almost always gonna cause API breakage when you change the indent implementation details. If you'd want to do opaque errors, you can use boxed in error. That's a way of doing it. Another way of doing it is by using anyhow error, which is another opaque error type in Rust. The difference is anyhow error is smaller. So boxed in error takes two words. Uh, anyhow error takes one word. So that makes it slightly less expensive. It also can support recovering the stack trace without using the nightly compiler. That requires obviously opting in and has a performance impact. And last but not least, it allows you to add context as an error travels from lower level in the stack all the way to the top. And we're gonna see that in a second. So I'll take a nanosecond here to address one thing that often happens when you're talking about Rust. 
as people say, anyhow is for application and this error is for libraries. This is absolutely false. You can use opaque errors in libraries if you need an opaque error. So if you need a source, it's perfectly okay to use any hour error. If you don't want the client code to be able to distinguish the failure modes for whatever reason, it's perfectly okay to use any hour error. In the same way, if you need to signal that there are different error modes that need to be handled differently, you can definitely use this error even if it's an application. So it's really about the type of rust of error handling pattern that you wanna suggest to the client instead of is this a binary or is this a library? That doesn't really make any sense. And it's the same actually in any language, not just in Rust. Back to Niao error, the thing that is, now is about, that is nice about the Niao is that you can create, you can add additional context. So while you're doing error handling, you're, you do not always handle the error the first time it happens. Sometimes you bubble it up all the way, very often up until the very top layer because you cannot handle it and you need to return a user facing report. One thing you can do is you cannot context about what type of high level operation you were trying to accomplish. So if you're creating an article, it's not necessarily because you have an article API. It might be because you're doing a PR launch for a product and publishing an article is one step of a more complex PR launch workflow. And so you can capture this information by adding context when you retro the error up to the calling function. And then the operator, if you print the entire error stack, is gonna have that nice contact that goes down in context level as it reads through. And that makes troubleshooting a lot easier. And it's actually, I mean, you just like a couple of words every time you're retrieving something and you're gonna be very thankful you did that when you actually have that error in production. Once again, uh, as I said, you always want to capture the error chain. So when doing all this work because you want the error chain in the logs because you're gonna look at the logs when stuff goes wrong. But not all information is useful. You should not be logging errors every time you retro an error up in the stack. Because what this generates is, first of all, a lot of volume for your login pipeline, which may be expensive, depending on who's your vendor. Secondly, it generates a lot of confusion and noise, because you have the same error being logged several times with different levels of information. And sometimes the error may have been handled at a certain point in the calling stack, but you still have all the logs from the lower levels. And so you're like, did this error happen? Was this error actually handled? You always want to log errors at the point in time when they're handled. If they're never handled, that's usually at the top level, you have a last resort error handler. We usually logs every time a 500 or whatever that is, if we are doing an API. Beautiful, that was a long run with a lot of background noise at the beginning, um, but we survived. Um, Thanks for having me, and if you have any questions, this is the moment. Go. A lot louder. What do you mean? So, the question is, how do you combine errors coming from different sources? What kind of different sources? Okay, so you're saying if you have an error coming from the database and an error coming from an HTTP client and you wanna combine the context. Um, so there's two kinds of joins that can happen. So one thing is you have a function that can fail in two different ways and you don't actually want the client to be able to distinguish. In which case you use an opaque error type. So you put an anyhow error or a boxed in error and the client cannot tell what actually happens. So that's an API design choice. Another thing you can have is you can have operations which are like batch mode, in which you can have multiple operations and you want a semantic which can be throw if any fails or like throw, like execute as many as possible and then report as many errors as possible. That's a slightly different type of error pattern. It's not as neatly serviced uh, by the Rust abstraction. Uh, you actually get into some pretty gnarly code because then you need to start you know, returning vector of errors, which operation has actually failed. It's not the be most beautiful type of code. It can be done, but I think we don't yet have a very neat abstraction for, so basically the assumption is when you have an error stack trace, if you want, so if you traverse the sources, that's a linked list at the moment. So a source may have another source that may have another source. In some application, there's actually a tree. So a source may have multiple sources, but that's not neatly represented. 
Is that an oversight? Probably. Uh, I don't know of any good implementation of an alternative like batch chatter type, but I've had that problem in applications. So probably it would be something that would be worth doing to an extent. But it's a good question. Okay, so the question is, if you have an open source library and you have an error enum, how do you avoid breaking changes? That once again depends. Uh, you fundamentally have two options. So if you just have a raw enum, like the one I've showed you throughout the talk, every time you add a new variant, that's gonna be a breaking change. Because if they have a match statement that needs to be exhaustive, so suddenly the compiler is gonna say, hello, hello, there's a new variant, what you wanna do here? Multiplied by as many number of times you're actually invoking the function. Sometimes this can be desirable. Like if your function implementation is substantially changing, you wanna alert your client code. Like you actually need to think about what's happening here. Sometimes this is not desirable. Like may you may be adding a new variant, which is not actually a new variant. Like perhaps you had a generic catch-all and now you want to actually lift out a specific case because somebody complained that they actually care about when you have an HTTP client which is due to I.O. error and you want to call out I.O. error specifically as a failure mode. People do two things, like there's two patterns. Uh, one pattern is you don't have an error enum, um, you have an error struct, and the error struct contains an error type. That error type is an enum which is annotated with non-exhaustive. So non-exhaustive means that they always need to have a catch-all pattern if you want in their match statements. And so adding new enums is not gonna be a breaking change because it's gonna invoke that catch-all logic. You can also just slap like non-exhaustive directly on, on your error enum, and that's also nice, Th that works. The reality is that it's very difficult to make that judgment call because you need to know what the application does. Um, so for some applications, the new error mode might not be a problem. For some applications, it might actually be extremely important to know that this happens. And at this point in time, Rust does not give you a mechanism to opt in into exhaustiveness for a non-exhaustive enum. So to be able to say, when I'm matching this error, even if it says it's non-exhaustive, I want to have, I don't know, a warning when a new variant gets added. Um, this is actually not possible at the moment and would be a very nice addition. It was discussed in some issues in the Rust issue tracker. If you go dig like a couple of years ago, I think Didolne posted some stuff about it, but nothing came out of it. Um, so we can start the conversation again, which I was meaning to do anyway, so I might. Any question which is not from Alessandro? <laughs> I'll take that as a no. Well, thank you. <laughs> 